And so I'm a little girl living in Kabul, Afghanistan, and there's rockets going off outside of our window. Um, and it got to the point where we didn't have windows anymore because they were rocketed. And um, three times in a week, my parents pronounced me dead. Uh, they'd say, oh, what? yeah, like things would happen where um, harsh winter, they would think I froze overnight because um, we didn't have any heat. We were just in survival mode. And so there was one night the, a rocket hit the glass in the living room and um, it actually shattered all over my body. And so my parents just were living in this constant state of fear of losing their children. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Let's Give a Damn. I'm Nick LaPara, your friend and the host of this lovely podcast. I cannot tell you how damn excited I am for this new year, 2019. I don't know what it is about this year in particular, but I know it's going to be bonkers. I mean, I always feel very ready for the new year, but this year feels very different. You too, right? I don't think it's just me. Before I introduce you to my guests today, I want to read you a poem. This poem is by Warson Shire, a Kenyan-born Somali poet, writer, and educator based in the UK. I want to read you her poem titled Home. Why? Because there are so many conversations going on right now about immigrants and refugees. Social media and the media in general have made it very difficult to have civil and decent conversations about these issues. And it's so easy to criticize, caricature, and be judge, jury, and executioner from the sidelines, isn't it? Each and every one of us, regardless of our views or political leanings, need to learn how to step back, shut up, and learn. A quick note on this poem before I read it. In it, Warson uses the N-word. As a non-black person, I don't feel comfortable using that word even if I'm quoting a black poet. So I'll be omitting the one line that contains the N-word. And after this podcast is over, please go to YouTube, find a video of Warson Shire reading her poem, and listen to it in its entirety there. Okay, here's the poem. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. Your neighbors running faster than you, breath bloody in their throats. The boy you went to school with, who kissed you dizzy behind the old tin factory, is holding a gun bigger than his body. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. No one leaves home unless home chases you, fire under feet, hot blood in your belly. It's not something you ever thought of doing until the blade burnt threats into your neck. And even then you carried the anthem under your breath, only tearing up your passport in an airport toilet, sobbing as each mouthful of paper made it clear that you wouldn't be going back. You have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. No one burns their palms under trains, beneath carriages. No one spends days and nights in the stomach of a truck, feeding on newspaper, unless the miles traveled mean something more than the journey. No one crawls under fences. No one wants to be beaten, pitied. No one chooses refugee camps or strip searches where your body is left aching or prison because prison is safer than a city of fire and one prison guard in the night is better than a truckload of men who look like your father. No one could take it. No one can stomach it. No one skin would be tough enough. The go home blacks, refugees, dirty immigrants, asylum seekers sucking our country dry. They smell strange savage, messed up their country, and now they want to mess ours up. How do the words, the dirty looks, roll off your backs? Maybe because the blow is softer than a limb torn off, or the words are more tender than 14 men between your legs, or the insults are easier to swallow than rubble, than bone, than your child's body in pieces. I want to go home, but home is the mouth of a shark. Home is the barrel of the gun, and no one would leave home unless home chased you to the shore, unless home told you to quicken your legs, leave your clothes behind, crawl through the desert, wade through the oceans, drown, save, be hunger, beg, forget pride. Your survival is more important. No one leaves home 
until home is a sweaty voice in your ear saying, leave, run away from me now. I don't know what I've become, but I know that anywhere is safer than here. Friends, you're inevitably feeling a few different emotions right now. I know I did after I heard this poem for the first time and truthfully, every time I read this poem. Maybe pause this podcast for a moment so you can sit with those feelings and then come back. There's a very good reason for me reading that poem on the podcast today. Today, I have a fantastic, hard, but fantastic conversation ready for you today. Last week, I sat down to chat with my friend, Sinzella Atmar. She has an incredible story. Parts of it are going to blow your freaking minds. I'll try not to give too much of her story away right now because I want her to tell it, but a couple of highlights. She and her family came to America from Afghanistan as refugees in the late 90s. And today, she runs an incredible organization called Relief Without Borders. That's all I'm going to say for now because I want you to hear the stories, the details of her story firsthand. So here's my conversation with my friend and amazing human, Sinzella Atmar. Sanzella, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. So excited uh, to do this. We're finally doing it. Uh, your apartment's amazing. Thank you. People <laughs> cannot see it, but we're here. Maybe I'll take a picture and share oh, that nice. just so they can be a little jealous. Yeah. The view's amazing. We're in Nashville, and the view is quite something. It is, and it's been a beautiful week. We just yep. keep waiting for winter to come, but it's it's playing games with us. It is playing games. Well, I'm fine if it's playing games because I don't, yeah, it can stay stay this temperature and higher. I'm fine with that. Yeah. So we've got a lot to talk about. You have an interesting story. I can't wait to share it with everybody. Uh, For most of the people, it'll be their first time hearing your name and hearing your story. So I'm very excited to be the one to introduce you to them. Thank you. Um, So let's get started with some background. We're going to talk about how we met through this Be Unafraid campaign and our friend Jeremy. We're going to talk about Relief Without Borders. Before all of that, Tell us your story because it's fascinating. Uh, it'll be a lot. It'll be a lot different than ninety nine point nine percent of people listening, but it's a much needed sort of story uh, for things that we're thinking through and dealing with today in America and even abroad. But you know, mainly America. So go back as far as you want to um, and tell us some of your story. Thank you. I would love to share that. So I was born in Afghanistan, which is a country that most people only have one association too, and they hear it on the news. And so really, I was hesitant to ever share my story until a few years ago. And through school, I always avoided telling people my story. And I finally gained the confidence to kind of share my story. And so back, I would say 2012 might have been the first time I shared Hmm. this. And I started to tell people, oh, I was born in Afghanistan. And then they kept asking questions, which curated me having to tell them my background. And so my family is originally from Kabul, Afghanistan. My parents were raised in Jalalabad and Lahman. And they come from huge families. And my immediate family was eight members. And so during the invasion of the extremists, what we now know them as Taliban. Everyone has a a name for them, Al-Qaeda. That was going on back in the early 90s, but people were not aware of it in the Western states. So we were actually experiencing them on a personal level. They They were attacking families, anybody who didn't believe in their ideology. They were being persecuted. They were being killed on spot. And so my family, being an upper class family who had Um, relatives in the government, we were targets. We were who they wanted to kill. And me being a brand newborn had zero understanding of what was going on. I mean, there's so many studies on kids do not know their conditions or where they're at. This is normal to them, whatever it is. Doesn't matter where you live, you just, you can make fun and you see that a lot. And so I'm a little girl living in Kabul, Afghanistan, and there's rockets going off outside of our window Um, And it got to the point where we didn't have windows anymore because they were rocketed. And um, three times in a week, my parents pronounced me dead. Uh, They'd say, oh, yeah, like things would happen where um, harsh winter, they would think I froze overnight um, because we didn't have any heat. We were just in survival mode. And so there was one night a rocket hit the glass in the living room and 
um, it actually shattered all over my body. And so my parents just were living in this constant state of fear of losing their children. And so my mom hit, hit a breaking point. She finally hit that point. And my dad was like, no, no, like we can't leave. Where are we going to go? And my mom was like, I don't care where we Anywhere. go. I'm leaving. Even if I die on the journey, I'm getting out of this, the city. And thankfully that week, the government pronounced a ceasefire. So it was a 72-hour agreement for everyone to put their guns down um, and stop stop attacking each other. And so we took that opportunity to leave this temporary home that we were staying in. What was the purpose of that ceasefire? Was it to give people a chance to get out if they wanted? Or Exactly. Yeah. So there's actually Westerners in the country for business. That were stuck. And, yeah. yeah. And so they were they pronounce ceasefires when they really need to move people. And um, it actually helps for those situations primarily. But then, of course, the locals are taking that opportunity to move to a different city, um, one that's more safe, where, where they're not as active. And so the things that we now know have been going on for decades. And so as a kid, I was born into this. And I'm in this country, and we're, we're actually journeying east, and there's a point where you can't drive anymore. Once um, you hit certain mountains, you have to stop uh, using your vehicle and you have to walk at hmm. certain points to enter um, Jalalabad. And so my family is trying to journey east. And once we get to Jalalabad, there's actual UN reps saying that you couldn't get into that city. They're like, no, you have to keep going. We're sending everyone to a refugee camp. Like you can't enter into the city. So my family's plan was to go stay with relatives in the neighboring city of Jalalabad. And we weren't allowed to to go there because there was a mass, you know, all these people are moving, mm -hmm. trying to get away from the activity in Kabul, and they they can't handle that. And so they're like, here, we've built these refugee camps for you guys. Go east another eight hours. And so there's buses taking you. And um, it's right over the border of Pakistan. And to this day, that refugee camp is still there. A lot of people know the camp because the woman who was on the cover of National Geographic's that Steve McCurry photographed. Mm -hmm. um, the mm -hmm. photo is called The yeah, Afghan Woman. Yep. She actually lived in the same camp as I did. Oh, wow. And so she was there maybe a decade prior to me. And so this camp is well known in Peshawar. And so my family of eight enters the camp. We have a letter from the United Nations saying that we're allowed in. I actually have that letter I can share with you guys oh, wow. as well. And so we get to this camp, and unfortunately, in this camp, of course, there's bad guys there. Like, there's not a look to who's bad. There's not a profile. There's, it, it's all ideology, and you can't put a face to that. And so you don't know who's good and bad, who's an extremist, who's not. And in the refugee camps, while you're setting up your tent, while you're in the lines to get food, there's extremists. And so they're picking on people. They're bullying. They're asking you questions. Who are you? Who's your family? Why are you uh, pale? Why do you look like middle class? Like if you don't look dirt poor, you are their target because mm. they uh, want to know who you are. And so my parents would purposely keep us dirty. My parents would make me look even more gross. Uh, like they wouldn't wash me so that I looked very, very poor and... Unfortunately, one day, my mom was encountered by an extremist, and he asks my mom, oh, is that your son? And it was my 13-year-old brother, Iqbal. Um, and he was very pale-skinned and had light brown hair, curly hair, little Goldilocks hair, and um, had hazel eyes. So he was just such a piercing little boy. Yeah, you stuck out. He, he stuck out. And then the rest of my family had dark hair, and so... He stuck out around us, and this man goes, oh, is that your son? And my mom went and pulled him and was like, yeah, that's my son. Leave him alone. And he, he kept asking my mom, who are you? What did you do back in? Because you can tell, you know, from features in your face that you're Afghan. And so he was like, who are you? Where where'd you come from? And my mom was like, I was a teacher, you know, for really she was a professor for biology and chemistry, but she didn't want to. She want to play it up. Yeah, she yeah. didn't want to play herself up and become a target. And so she was like, I was just a teacher, like trying to avoid the conversation. And then that day 
after she gets the food for the family from the food distribution, she looks around and she's counting her kids and she notices that Iqbal's not there. Mm. And how the refugee camps work is if someone dies or something, they announce it on a loudspeaker. And so they are announcing, they're like, of course they don't know names. And so they're like, boy, around 10 years old, come check if it's yours. And, you know, parents run and they go see if it's their kid. And so unfortunately we hear on the intercom that someone's been killed. And so my mom just is breaking down and my um, dad actually ended up having a heart attack because of the depression. And they went and identified his body. And at this point they don't know what to do with him because they're in a refugee camp. And so what happened was those extremists pushed him in front of a vehicle and another guy ran him over. And so they just bully on innocent people. There was no reason for them to ever kill anybody, especially an innocent little 13-year-old mm. boy who did nothing. Like, he never even interacted with them. He was a very shy boy. He always followed my mom around. He was very loyal to my mom, whereas, like, us kids, we were probably playing and, like, doing our own thing. Mm -hmm. And so that that really caused a, oh. a severe depression towards my parents. And my dad is going through a heart attack. He needs a triple bypass surgery, and no one can perform the surgery on him. So he's practically bedridden, and my mom is just depressed and numb. My dad's uh, siblings end up helping him bury his son, and my mom's just mourning. And unfortunately, in this culture... Even mourning is hard because it's culturally not acceptable, you know, to have depression or have these things because people have not yet, you know, acknowledged that those aren't weaknesses. They're they were seen as they're weaknesses. actually yeah, yeah they're they're looked at as like oh you're yeah you're sick and you have mental disorders whereas it's not looked at as like everyone experiences depression mm. or everyone experiences these emotions so you almost have to hide if you're upset and stuff. And so fortunately people, people are all distressed, but no one's dealing with it. Right. And so my parents ended up having to stay in these um, conditions with us now five kids for two years. So this happened immediately when we got into the refugee camp. And then we stayed in those conditions for another year and a half. During that time, we meet an organization called Shelter Now. Shelter Now was a food distribution nonprofit that worked with refugees, and they're still, I think, to this day, working in Pakistan. They're kind of famous for having the two missionaries, um, Dana Curry, mm. that was on the news, mm -hmm. and her friend. So they, they're famous for that, and so a lot of attention came to them for that. And people know that they were present in that camp in Peshawar, and so my mom... Even though she's very depressed, she can't help but have this personality where she just befriends everybody. Mm -hmm. She's like, I call her the Oprah of Afghanistan. <laughs> she just makes friends with everyone. And so she ends up, um, while she's getting food distribution, she befriends the team members. And she's befriending them, and she's talking to them, and she ends up becoming their translator. And so my mom ends up helping them learn the new dialects of this flow of Afghan people coming into their camp. Like initially it was just Pakistani uh, refugee camp. So like the people that were in there were only from Pakistan. And then all of a sudden this huge flow of Afghans come in, which on the news recently you might've seen how they were all sent back. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people have called that home for decades. Thankfully we were decades. only decades. Yeah. So there's some kids that have only known that as their home. And then they're sent back to Afghanistan. And so we were thankfully only there for, for two years. And while we were in there, we started to, you know, learn, okay, here's where you go to class. Like as a kid, it, there's, it becomes a community. And so you have where you get your food and then you made your friends. So my mom made friends and I'm walking around like as a little newborn and I don't even have pants on. Like I'm just like this newborn kid that's under five years old, my mom told me that I poop once. Like, she's telling me the conditions of, of where we yeah. were in the camps, but that was just the norm. Yeah. And so my older siblings are going to an English class, trying to learn English. And in that class, my oldest brother, Atal, 
he um, applies for this little, it's a lottery, like put your name, put your family members' names. They help him fill it out. He's at the time 15 years old. And it's a visa lottery. If your family gets picked, the United uh, States is going to give you a visa to come to the U.S. It was something that nobody really thought they would ever get. And so each country that they want to invite people from, Mm -hmm. Afghanistan was on the list in the late 90s. And so in 1997, the Atmar family was selected. And so here we are now a family of seven. Out of how many? I mean, how many people? It is a 1%. So I don't know application numbers, but yeah, the likeliness of you winning that, there's people that... Slim to none. Yeah. And then we only applied one year. And there's families that have been applying. They apply every time. They apply every year for 20 years, and they're still not getting even heard, you know. And so there's families that actually get divided when they win the visa lottery because their mom's approved, but their dad's not. And somehow my family of seven had a 180 moment. So we're living in the refugee camps, and they're like, okay, well, you have to pay for your flights to come to the U.S. And so here, here we are, you know rallying up 12 plus thousand dollars to get our family to the U.S. And funny enough, we moved straight to Nashville. And so our family just leaves with two suitcases of nothing. I don't know why we even brought anything, but we, we arrive, we, and I distinctly. How old were you at the time? I was roughly. Five, six. Roughly six years old. And so I have a very black and white memory of not remembering anything in the refugee camp. And then boom, I remember so much of the journey here. Hmm. So I remember the airplane. I remember the terminal I landed in. I remember the smell of the airport at BNA, Nashville. So, but I blocked out everything prior to that. So we land in Nashville, May of 1997. And we are welcomed with open arms. We ended up picking Nashville because my mom's older sister and her husband were doctors here. And so they were like, you know, Nashville's cost of living is better than X, Y, and Z. Mm-hmm. Like they, they sold the city to us. Funny enough, the friends that my mom made through Shelter Now were in Franklin, Tennessee, 15, 20 minutes away. Mm. So immediately my mom comes to Nashville and has friends. <laughs> and she's like, oh, Wild. I know. Yeah. And so she she's already adjusting to the community. And with the Visa Lottery, your family gets health care, that they really integrate you into society. And because we weren't, a lot of countries weren't getting it at the time, when you came in as a foreigner, really the U.S. and the community that we were in was so welcoming. Mm. It, it didn't have that negative stigma that now is associated to refugees. So when we were refugees in 1997, all of our neighbors would come over. They would, you know, want to try our ethnic food and My mom would cook for our community, and there was really a positive association to that. People would drop off furniture. They're like, we we see that you don't have this or that. We we were just really helped. And I have such fond memories of an elderly woman knowing that my all my teeth were rotted because in the refugee camps I didn't brush my teeth, and so all my baby teeth were rotted. And so she went and just before my insurance hit, she took me to the dentist and took care of all of that for me. And then there was a woman who dropped her car off at our house and goes, God told me to give you my car, um, but I need a ride (laughs) home. So, so many things would happen. And we, we were just really thankful to be here. Like there was such, such safety here. There was opportunity here, you know? And so we, we were ingrained in the community in Nashville and my mom um, ends up actually spending over a decade back in Afghanistan through um, being a translator for the U.S. military. And so she ends up going overseas a few years after we move here, post 9-11. Yeah. So she's only really here, 97 to post 9-11. And my dad is taking care of the kids and my mom's working overseas as the breadwinner. So that dynamic was interesting. I got to hear a lot about Afghanistan anytime I talked to my mom. So I'd be on the phone with my mom maybe once a month, you know, talking to her. Did she come back at all during that time or was it 10 years? 
It was um, just like a soldier overseas. So, so she would, every, yeah, wow. every nine months, every 11 months, she would come home for 30 days and then she would go back. And she Crazy. lived a life like a military um, soldier would where she, you know, she wore the gear and she went out on missions with them. She has amazing stories of her time during that it, where she, you know, would go to a village and get random ingredients and cook for soldiers that were crying because they missed their wives and um, families. And th- they would call her Auntie Nazifa because they're like, wow, if we didn't have you here, Amazing. you know, to comfort us. And these are soldiers, you know, that, uh, the what yeah. we see them as is such strong people, but everyone feels, you know, again, back to my point, everyone has weak moments. And so yeah. she saw that and would go and, cook them home cooked meals and stuff and really love on them. And so she ends up spending all this time in Afghanistan, which really exposes me to what's going on there. I would see, I would turn on the news and kind of see what's going on through the news, but then hear from my mom, oh, this little girl, she's she's mute, blind, doesn't have any parents, she's in an orphanage and she's sending me pictures. Um, and my mom, one thing I told her, I was like, mom, I'm not as exposed to some of these photos you send me because she'll send stuff that's kind of brutal. And, mm. you know, our our minds, we're, if you haven't seen it yet, you almost, you get scared. You're like, whoa, I can't handle that. Um, she'll send me really sick photos of, of, you know, elderly people or kids. And she's like, yeah, this is, this was her daily life. So she was just trying to share elements of her life with her kids, but I would cry seeing some of the stuff and I would feel really, really sad. And then I was like, but why is everything on the news? Nothing like this. Like what we see on the news is so brutal and talks so negative about what's going on overseas. And then I almost got a behind the scenes, you know, view of what was going on through her lens. The two didn't match. And so I'm going through school and fortunately saw a little bit of bullying um, just for being a Middle sure. Eastern kid, kids would say stuff like, oh, is your uncle Osama bin Laden? Like, they would be pretty mean to me, and I would be like, you don't even understand that this country's, you know, a developing country that's war-torn, and the extremists that are in the country, it's not all of the people there. There are a very small number. Yeah, there's bad people everywhere. There's bad people in America. There's bad people overseas. There, there's bad people in Africa. Any country, there's bad people. Right. And unfortunately, our country is is going through a really hard time right now. And so as a teenager, I didn't understand why people were picking on it. And I realized it was because of what they saw on the news. As soon as I got out of high school, I had such a passion of... I need to show people this other side. And so I started to take my mom's photography and I would share it here and there. You know, I was still shy and I didn't know how to do that. And I really started to investigate what are personal stories. I loved what Humans of New York was doing. Mm -hmm. I loved what these online campaigns were doing in this time of technology. We had access, you know, everyone was on social media. Everyone has access to technology. So in my head, I was like, how can I s- just start to sh- tell a, a different glimpse? And I was scared that I would have a negative response. And so I, would, I did it very slowly because you're talking about something that people are very opinionated on. So I started to just share photos. And then from that, I started a campaign called People of Afghanistan. And within three months, 40,000 people were asking for more photos. And they're that that was that point where I was like, oh my goodness, people care. Mm. And it was so refreshing to realize that humanity is still intact. And as, as much as we want to talk about politics and as much as we want to talk about religion, at the end of the day, we all have empathy. Mm-hmm. And even those bad guys probably have that. When I realized that, I was like, okay, there's a movement happening and how do we take those next steps? So that's that's kind of that background story of how it all started. So you were 2011, you're like nine or 10 when 9-11, 2001 Mm -hmm. happens, right? Um, And you're in Nashville at the time, (laughs) which is, you know, it's heart of the South. It is. And um, not as, not as progressive in a lot of ways, especially at that time, it's a lot more progressive now in a lot of ways. (laughs) But back then, 
did your dad or in, did your parents, I mean, your dad was here as the primary caretaker at mm -hmm. that time. Did, did you guys have to have any talks like a, around, like be more careful? Uh, people are going to be more upset at our people. <laughs> like I can imagine that it was just a very tense time to be, I mean, especially someone from Afghanistan, you Definitely. know, in that, in that part of the world. Like how did you guys navigate that yeah. season of life? I had two different kind of role models to look at. So I had my mom who was, you know, very proud and able to talk about Afghanistan. She wanted to just love on everyone, f feed everybody. My mom's love language was cooking. And so... Yeah, obviously with yeah. the soldiers and everything. That's oh, really cool, yeah. She loved uh, cooking for every neighbor in our neighborhood. And my aunt, so after 9-11, my aunt tells her, hey, you need to stop, you know people in America aren't like this. Like they're, they're not used to you cooking so much for them and stuff. And so my mom actually started getting scared to be as connected in the community. And so she started to shy away. And my dad has always been a little shy because his English isn't that good, but that caused me to stop talking about it. So that's what essentially made me mute to sharing my story. Never had I prior to that. Uh, but post 9-11, you don't want to talk about it. You almost want people to just assume um, that you're Italian or something like, oh, let's just not talk about it. But what I then realized with time is that I, I needed to talk about it because people only had one perspective mm -hmm. of the Middle East. And it was so unfortunate because there's crises and war in so many different places. And just the fact that you know, this is what's happening in the Middle East. It doesn't take away from the positive things that are happening there. There's still a ton of positive, beautiful people there. They're experiencing so much unfortunate circumstances and being targeted by these bad people. And so if I can share their stories, then maybe people will be interested to learn a little bit more. It's funny that I have my own little version of what you just said. You know, I'm mm -hmm. my dad is Guatemalan, was born yeah. in Guatemala. He came over here as, as an immigrant. It wasn't until being an immigrant, legal or illegal, mm -hmm. became this like horrible thing in the last few years. Exactly. That I actually gained, I gained way more pride. Like I never, I would never shied away from it. I mean, being Guatemalan, half Guatemalan was always part of my story and heritage, but I never shared that information willingly. It was, if asked, here's the information. But ever since that happened, uh, you know, the last couple of years has, has kind of gone the way it's gone. We won't get into politics today that much anyway. <laughs> That's how I introduce myself as someone from, Gu because it's it's a very beautiful country. There's a lot of amazing things about it, but it, it too was war torn, 30 year civil war. Yeah. I mean, it's a pretty shitty place in a lot of ways. So it was just never like, oh, it's not like I came from, you know, France, you know, something like that. And so I always just kind of shied away from it. And it wasn't until, it's kind of funny how like, it wasn't until it became even worse to be Guatemalan that I actually got the A topic like, of like, conversation. Oh, you, like, <laughs> it's pretty great to be Guatemalan. Yeah. You know, and, and, and we're not all, it gave me the the opportunity to, to share Definitely. Like I'm the product of an immigrant family. Mm -hmm. um, do you think I'm shitty? Like, do you think I should not be here? Yeah. You know, 30 years after my dad came. Like, um, so anyway, that's interesting that that you got more passion and excited for sure to share now that this was like a hot topic. Something exactly. Where it, it, some people actually maybe would think that you'd shut up more about it, not want to yeah. share. I am Italian. I'm Greek. You could you could pass as a few different, yeah. you know. And you're like, no, I'm, I'm yeah. again. Well, I never come off abrasive when I talk about Afghanistan. Even if someone comes on about the Which topic. Which is great. Super helpful. Yeah. yeah. And if someone's abrasive and says a comment, I'm very even keeled. And I just try to ask them, you know, what their perspective is. But really, we're all coming from immigrant families. I mean, yes. So yes. it is interesting that people kind of forget that. And so there's all those conversations I could probably have with you and get really passionate about saying, you know, everyone in the U.S., unless you're, you know, Native American, is an immigrant. But it's not really about that because now we're in a time where we all are capable of having conversations online. And we we sometimes um, have them in a way where we become more confident behind the keyboard and we get a little too opinionated online. Mm -hmm. But really the positive point of 
the internet and social media is that you can connect with people in different places. I've made friends in countries that I have probably will never visit, Mm. you know, in India and all these countries. And it's super beautiful that we're now able to learn about other cultures in a way that we didn't used to be able to. Like our parents almost in a way have an excuse for not being educated on certain topics but in this day and age we really don't have an excuse Mm -hmm. we have the internet we can research there's so much that's going on on the news but if that's your only outlet of getting information i just hope that people will do some research and really learn about a country and all that it offers and so that's what i tried to do with the middle east in general i was just trying to give people a little bit of information that wasn't negative news i was like hey here's a story of a woman, here's a story of a kid, here's a story of a man, a teenager, just read their stories. Because at the end of the day, that's really how you connect with people. Facts, statistics, all this stuff doesn't matter. When you start to tell a story, that's when you really get to learn about people beyond these lines of countries. Oddly enough, that's sort of how we met. We met yeah. we met one time previously, our friend Jeremy Cowart has been on the podcast a couple times introduced us, we had coffee. But then I got to see more of your work and more about you through this campaign that you and Jeremy did with Catholic Relief Services here in Nashville, right? The Be Unafraid campaign. It's precisely what you just described. So describe, because I'll I'll link to all this in the show notes, but describe that campaign. And then I'll share a little bit about something that came out of that to more people that I interviewed on the podcast as well, a big story that we did. But it's precisely that, right? It is. Yeah, so go. I won't give any way. Talk about Be Unafraid and sort of what that project, what it entailed and kind of what happened as a result. Like maybe there were some neutral stories that came out of there or amicable, you know, let's take a photo together. But there were some stories where it changed lives. Definitely. So storytelling is something that I think you share a passion for, Jeremy shares a passion for, and I share a passion for. So when this opportunity came to work on the Be Unafraid campaign with CRS and him, I was really excited about it. And so initially um, we were brainstorming and we sat down and we're like, okay, how can we showcase people's journeys to the U.S. and show that they they have these journeys some are beautiful, some are, you know, emotional, some are not, not beautiful. And how do we tell those in a very um, open environment? And so we invited a few dozen refugees, immigrants, and then we invited domestic citizens all to Jeremy's studio uh, for a three day shoot. And we just let everyone tell their story. And everything that happened in those three days was organic. Nothing was scripted. We just simply asked people to share their story and their opinions on on this topic of welcoming refugees and everyone that had a a very strong opinion against it after they heard people's journeys here we had people crying mm. and r- they realized wow if i had to you know hide in a cave with my children and the people that were supplying the food to us as refugees seeking to come over into neighboring countries, they were hiding in um, actual caves and the people that were supplying the non-bread to them were poisoning them. And so once they would hear these stories of the trauma that their kids experienced, the kids that they lost in those journeys, there's no human that can't empathize with that. Um, You would actually have to like lack something to not have empathy. And so everyone has that ability to have empathy. And there was a lot of breaking moments. And we, as the crew, were crying. And Jeremy was getting emotional. Everyone was getting emotional seeing this unfold. And so we were able to share all of that. And we called it Be Unafraid to have those conversations. And post-production, we really just welcomed people to Go and talk to someone that you don't know that well. And it's okay to talk about, you know, Mm. topics that you don't really, really sometimes want to talk about. Mm. Oh, you're, you know, you're a refugee. What does that mean? It's okay to ask those questions. Um, That's how you kind of learn and grow. So, yeah, fascinating campaign that, um, that I know has changed lives. That concept wasn't new to me. We've been doing Mm -hmm. that for a long time as a family and me, but it was still, it was a great twist on it and a take on it. Obviously, Jeremy's photography is oh, yeah. you know, killer. It's next second to none. And and then out of that, I 
helped. So there's two people in particular mm-hmm. that really stood out to me because of the polar opposite nature of where these two people were coming from, Binyad and Maggie. Maggie being a uh, now former, and this is not, the Trump supporter part of this is not the only part of it, but it was, that was her thing. Facebook profile picture was her at a Trump rally, selfie at a Trump rally. There's a big story that I think Newsweek did or um, some big publication did where it's Trump's on the front and the whole cover was him and she's in, she's in the photo, her and her dad. And anyway, she came into this campaign being vehemently, not just like sort of, you know, opposed to it. She was pretty dead set on all or close to all refugees and immigrants that come here want to take from us. They want to take advantage of us. They want to hurt us. Then she met Binyad and her, you know, Binyad and, and his family had similar stories. You know, it was very parallel to a lot of the story that you told and the struggles of getting over here. And they, I won't give away all the story. We told the whole story on the podcast a few weeks ago. Go listen to it, everyone. But it was amazing to see these two people, he, Binyad, having this idea of who all Trump supporters are, right? Because he's watch again, mm-hmm. he's watching it on TV and he's not all wrong, but yeah. that's not everybody. Mm-hmm. Right? I have, you know, people that voted for Trump in my immediate family and, and they're not that. They're not screaming and yelling and, mm-hmm. you know, that's just not who they are. And so once they met for coffee and then another coffee and then getting to know each other, her life got turned upside down. She's now, you know, pursuing a career in immigration law to yeah. help, you know, these. And then Binyad's worldview got turned upside down because he now isn't scared to talk to people, is scared to talk to people that might hold opposing views, right? Exactly. And that has to happen 10 million times in America today, right? Because mm-hmm. uh, we're just not doing that very well. We're going on social media, we're watching the news, we're reading these articles, and yet we have people within a stone's throw of our homes and of our workplaces that that relationship could clarify so much and we don't pursue it. Exactly. It's just like out there and we're not going after it. Definitely. I think a good um, stepping stone f- to that is everyone feels comfortable looking on social media at things. And so what I've found is that the initial um, step into the door sometimes is what you share online sure. and being careful yeah. about respecting everyone's perspective. And if we could all just respect each other a little bit and don't say you're wrong, you're so wrong. And it's hard to do that because sometimes we're pretty passionate, but hear people out. And so that platform of social media, and I say that a lot because that's really how people are yeah. talking that's nowadays. That's how they're getting it all. Yeah. Even and when so, we say news, they're getting it from a tweet or definitely from an Instagram post. Yes. News is now Twitter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that that's fine. We're growing with technology. We we're blessed enough to have, we're in the day and age of technology. And so what I'm learning is if I can get in the door with somebody and share a story about even just a kid in Afghanistan and show them that people have emailed me and said, wow, I never knew how beautiful Afghanistan was. I never knew that these people were there. Your culture is so beautiful. You guys are so hospitable. And then they just, they realize that they're people and it's not this you know, hazard sign of yeah. a of a place. And that's all I, I really want to show people when I'm sharing stories online and um, through Relief Without Borders is that initial story. Yeah, so let's get into Relief Without Borders. Yeah. So you've, um, this is not, you know, the only thing that you do, you do modeling and do some other stuff, but Relief Without Borders, that's something that you're very passionate about. And that's been a kind of a progression, right? It's been a work in progress trying it to has. get to what it is now. So tell us how you got there and what it is. And even if there's any ways people can get involved or want to start, yeah, just paying attention to what you're doing. Definitely. So Relief Without Borders was born a few years ago when I was in corporate America. I was working in digital forensics for all the law firms in Nashville. Mm -hmm. And so I had this full-time job, wake up, work there till it was dark. And I was doing it you know, with that mindset of this is safe, this is a paycheck, and, you know, this is corporate America. I was really thankful and for having this job because it was it was a great job. I was doing digital forensics, and I got to um, learn so much, grow. They would invest in my education in the corporation. So I was in a very comfortable place, but I was not – every second I had free time, I was – 
pursuing this passion and I didn't have a name for it yet. I was, you know, seeking and I called it at the time, you know, people of Afghanistan and I was just sharing people's stories. And so every time I would leave work in the evenings, I would stay on my computer and I kept working on my computer. And so it was born when a local attorney said, you know, when people are, if there's other nonprofits that are reaching out to you, thinking you're a nonprofit, you should probably make this a nonprofit. And I was, I told him, I said, so it was I've, just a project. At, yeah. At, at the time start. it was yeah. just an awareness campaign. It was called people of Afghanistan. And I w- I was not a nonprofit and there was three nonprofits that reached out to me in one month. All these organizations were reaching out saying, Hey, we love the, the stories you're telling in Afghanistan. Where can we send aid? And they thought that I had an office there. And in my head, I'm like, I'm actually now doing a disservice. Like I, I started to feel guilty versus like I was helping. I was like, oh, wow, people want to help. I'm the reason that they can't access these people. And so I immediately sat down um, with the law firm and we we made the nonprofit in 2017. And so Relief Without Borders was born. And then we get into, okay, what is the biggest need in these developing countries? And that's how we found our mission statement. Because at the at the end of the day, there's so many things you can do for any country. You can provide aid. You can create programs. There, every nonprofit has a mission statement. And so what I wanted to find is what is the end need of these developing countries? And it all comes down to children's education. And so if you can just educate these children, you can take them out of that cycle of poverty. And so that that's just common sense if you really think about it. So a decade ago... If those children in these developing countries were educated, those now adults would have the foundation to change their own countries. But when people are so focused on war and security and they're putting all their money into that, they're not able to invest in the kids. And so that was the the biggest need that I saw in Afghanistan Mm. is that they say a, over a quarter, so one in four kids in Afghanistan are involved in child labor. There's so many stories that we've told of kids working, and I share them to educate people about this crisis in Afghanistan is, okay, so a kid is five years old in America. They don't even, they wouldn't even sometimes understand like folding their, their clothes. Like right. I, I really can't think of a five-year-old in America that, is in a fight or flight mentality. Mm -hmm. But in these developing countries, it is so crazy that a five-year-old's capable of working in these conditions. I've seen um, five-year-olds work in brick factories because they're paying off their family's debt. Um, So their family is actually, you know, indebted to the brick factory owner because he gave him a loan and then the father might die. And then he essentially takes his kids and imprisons them into the factory. Mm. And so they're waking up day in and day out. And the the environment that they're in, in the factory, or even the rugs that we buy, the Persian rugs that we're buying, mm-hmm. a lot of the kids are making because a lot of the little girls, that's the only job opportunity that they have where they at least kind of feel safe because it's a home-run you know, job. And it's actually the hardest one to regulate. So the government's not able to catch child labor situations and they can only put so much effort in it. They sure. have laws that, you know, don't allow it. And so what I'm trying to do is showcase all that's that's going on in these countries and then find an immediate solution so we campaign for it. So our whole model is show the need through our platforms and then show how to get involved. Um, And so with education right now, we have a land in Afghanistan that we're going to be building our first school. So this is our Mm. first big project. And with that, we can educate 400 kids a year. And so we're Relief Without Borders is building our first private school on the land that was donated to us in Kabul. So this is our first big project. We've done aid missions. We've been able to do smaller projects, but being an a newer nonprofit, we're working just like that. And so I'm excited for people to see our stories online and just watch and find how they're passionate to get involved. If someone is inclined to help us, that's that's amazing. We're never one to pressure. We're 100% volunteer-based. I'm actually a volunteer. No one is on staff with Relief Without Borders. And we have dozens and dozens of mm. volunteers nationally overseas. We have people reaching out to us from Europe and everyone is 
seeing the stories first and foremost, and then finding ways to get involved. So I love the model that we're starting with. Of course, our goal is to grow to the point that we can have hundreds of people on staff because that's how much we're helping. But you're meeting us, you know, at the the first. I love it. Yeah, you're meeting us right when we're starting. And we have big goals and we have great opportunities in Afghanistan. We've met with the government a few times. We have really good connection with the the president and the mayor. And so we are really, our goals of where we're going to get to with education and law changes is is really big. So this year for Relief Without Borders is a very big year. We, you know, we're pending a few grants with the, the Afghan government and we really want to speak, emphasize the importance of changing the adoption laws there. Right now, you know, the adoption laws are so limited to only adopting out to Afghans. And oh. yeah, and so they don't let other countries right now adopt. And it's not because they believe in that. It's truly just lack of updating laws yep. because, yep. you know, they've been so so focused on security that these older laws have not been updated for foster care. There, There's no implementation of a foster care model. And so what I'm going to really rally for is changing the laws over over there. So that's, that's really important to me. I love it. It's huge. Um, so your story, really wild. <laughs> I really love where your head is at and where you plan to go with Relief Without Borders. And I love the dream, you know, hundreds of people. I love it. And I believe that it will happen. Let's get practical for a moment as we mm-hmm. begin to wrap up. So you've learned a lot, obviously. I mean, you're, you're young, but you've had lifetimes of experience already in certain, <laughs> in certain ways. The people listening to this podcast want to make a difference. I truly believe that because there's no way you could list, like some of these stories, they're fun and it's great, to, but there's always challenges being issued out. So people that come back to this show, they want to do something with their lives. They want to um, give more dams today than they did yesterday. So help us, give us some practical wisdom, just things that you have learned. It could be anything. Uh, it doesn't have to be deep or just just very practical things. What have you, what are some of the things that you have learned on your journey toward giving more dams as you get older, just practical things. Yeah. I think it's a lot of times we don't give because we don't think it's going to make a difference or we don't get involved because we think what is my time or money really going to do? You know, people have this, um, connotation with nonprofits that so much money goes to overhead. I, I want to push people to find something that they're passionate about. It doesn't have to be Relief Without Borders mission. Anything, it could be their own time just given in their own community. Mm-hmm. Some people really want to see where their $5, $100, where their money's going. And I would push people to find a, an organization that really reports back to them. Um, any organization can find their financial r- records online. Right. A lot of people don't know that, and they just uh, speak you know, by what they've heard from other people and they say, oh, you know, a lot of their aid money is going to overhead. And that's why Relief Without Borders to this day is 100% volunteer basis because we want to keep people's confidence in us. And so how our model is laid out is every money, every donation that comes in is going directly to aid. Our overhead is less than 5%. And so we are keeping it like that until we can afford to bring on um, staff members. So really my... My advice to people is do your research and know that the littlest time, effort, donation actually does make a difference if you invest it in the right right, right direction. And so with that research, that formula of doing your background homework and then giving your time or money really does make a change. You would... You would be so impressed what four dollars does in Relief Without Borders. Um, four dollars is what a child will work twelve hours a day for, and so that amount of money—I mean, that number has always stuck in my head because I've Just seen. Just nothing. Yeah, four dollars is nothing, and it blows my mind because a lot of the kids we we talk to in Afghanistan were like, "How much money do you make in a day?" And they say two dollars, four dollars, and they're they're busting their butts, you know, all day, and so. Whether it's you, you find that person yourself in your community overseas. I mean, you have a, a device. Everyone has it. I can say 99. I mean, the people listening to your podcast found your podcast, so they mm-hmm. probably have a phone. <laughs> yes. So everyone has this tool in their hand, and they can do research on it, and they can find people 
in one day you can make this happen. So don't make excuses on why why you can't and just figure out how you can. Yeah, I, th- I think that's really smart, the, the coupling there of mm-hmm. doing your research and then stop giving excuses. Stop yeah. making excuses and just in, give and invest, right? It's not For always sure. money. It's time. It's energy. It's yeah. all this stuff. But so many people are jaded. For They're sure. just tired. They've been burned. Or it's it's one of two things. Either they've seen the abuse. Definitely. Or it's second, third, fourth, fifth hand. Yeah. And they're saying, ah, fuck it. Like, I just, I'm not going to give at all exactly. because they abused it. There's, again, in every industry and in everything that's ever been done in the history of the world, somebody took advantage of a system yes. of a thing. Mm-hmm. We cannot throw the baby out with the bathwater, though. There's still good work being done. Definitely. Um, there's still tons of time, energy, and money. You're doing, I mean, you're doing this for free, right? So nobody yes. can. You know, hopefully that'll change sometime because it'll be nice for you to <laughs> not have to. W- but right now, nobody can say that about what you all are doing. Exactly. Because, um, and that's why I consult for other nonprofits. Yeah, right. Because, I mean, it's important to me to have this model for everyone and myself. I used to have these thoughts when I was, you know, the giver. And so I would think, well, where is this money going? And with Relief Without Borders' current campaign, we're going to have people on ground during the whole progress of the school being built. Mm, so cool. every donor that gives, we take your email and we give you a Regular report. Updates, yeah. yeah. And so they get those reports and they feel like a part of it and that they really get to see. And so if someone's passionate about, hey, when I give, I really want to see where it goes. We actually do video reports. There's been donors that have specifically given for a specific person and I get my photographer team and the delivery team to actually send it. Faraza is a little girl who's been aided three times because people just love her so much. They're, they see her beautiful eyes and they're like, I want to give to this girl. And we, we've we gone back and just aided her specifically because they, they're they adamant about their money going to her. And so we work with anybody if they, if they just want to generally give. I mean, Charity Water has the same model where when people give, there's two bank accounts. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's two bank that. accounts. One is for people who understand that nonprofits have overhead. And then there's another bank account for people who say, every cent I give, I want it specifically yeah. to go to water. And so I understand that logic as well and want to support people who, who have that concern. Someday you are going to die. Many, many years from now, <laughs> but we're all, death is Oh, that's in, the in thing I hate thinking about. Really? <laughs> death is, I think, uh, yeah, it's, you know, mystery, so it's, it's a little Yeah, scary. I mean, there is a, the, the mystery part is, yeah, it could happen right now, mm-hmm. <laughs> or it could happen 100 <laughs> years from now. Someday you're going to die. In this hypothetical scenario, I've been asked to give you a eulogy. Oh, wow. So, you know, your, your, your Relief Without Borders team, all the people you've helped, your family, everybody's there to celebrate and mourn your life. And I've been asked to speak words over your life. Um, Again, hypothetical. I mean, maybe it'll happen, but probably not. (laughs) Um, What do you hope that I would say on that day about your life and your legacy? Definitely. I would hope that you could say that I broke barriers between two cultures that, and our honestly, generations have dealt with negative stigmas. And I want to really represent and show people that there is more to that. And so with breaking barriers, I want to bring the modern day age technology into allowing people to help these people. And so during my eulogy, I hope that these are the things that I had accomplished Mm. and not just visions. And while we're doing this work, there's so many bigger goals that I have. And I hope that we can have a podcast again where you can talk about how we are, we are doing those those larger goals. But breaking barriers is my biggest thing because that when the wall is up, nothing can be done. And if we can let that wall down and actually connect with these people, then that's really where, I mean, you want to get really big, world peace happens. Yeah. And I, I always don't like saying that because it sounds funny when you say it, but Really, that's that's what it comes 100%. down to. We need to love every neighbor, not just the one that, right next to us. First of all, great legacy. I love, <laughs> I love that picture of breaking down barriers. I was just watching, I guess re-watching uh, a couple episodes of season 11 of uh, Anthony Bourdain's Parts Unknown show. Oh, yeah. And uh, he did an episode in Berlin, you know, where the mm-hmm. famous Berlin Wall is. Oh, I mean, there's still sections of it. And that was part of the show is like they leave up 
these, you know, sections of it as reminders of all of the fucked up things that happened in their past. But they tore that wall down, and they, they, a lot of the episode was talking about how East and West came together, and West was very, you know, modernized, and they had, you know, tourists were coming to it, but East was very like set in the past, and uh, the curfews and all sorts of stuff, mm-hmm. and then the two cultures emerging, and how important that was, you know. I guess we're how many years, 20, 30 years removed from the Berlin Wall falling, coming down. Like that has to happen everywhere. It's precisely why we're not, again, we're not going to get political here, but it's precisely why I think it's so absurd to think that we're going to fix issues by building a wall on our southern border. I'm Mm -hmm. all for border security. Definitely. I don't want, I don't want an American or a foreigner to come in and hurt my family. doesn't matter who it is. Exactly. This wall is not going to fix anything. Yeah, it's, it's it is only going to hurt America's reputation of being a nation that welcomes all people that are hurting, that are downtrodden, that are tired to come into our country and enjoy the freedoms that we have. We have lots of room. We have lots of Land. things to offer, <laughs> right? Like I, I mean, anybody that says we're packed and we have no more room, I'm like, are, have you been to the flyover states? Like there's a <laughs> lot more room here. Sure, if you live in New York, you're like, oh, we're packed. We'll go to Utah and hide Idaho and South Dakota and you know Wisconsin and Ohio. There's plenty of space. Exactly. We have lots of space. We have lots of resources. So I just, I love that word picture of like breaking down barriers and bringing two cultures and peoples and you know people of opposing ideologies and lifestyles and everything together to realize that at the end of the day all people from everywhere whether you're afghan or american or mexican we all need food Mm -hmm. we all need water we all want security we're all seeking comfort and success we all want you know what i'm saying we all want peace like we all share all these things in common Mm -hmm. um that we need to we need to be reminded of that often. I just I tweeted this morning at five thirty in the morning when I when I was up doing some work. Like I did like the less and more sign, and it was like less less walls, more bridges. Like we just we just yeah. need that. We need more bridges uniting peoples. Definitely physically and symbolically. And physically and symbolically, hundred percent. Yeah, literally physically, but also the symbolic ones so, because there's mm-hmm. a there's a lot of people listening that have walls between them and their neighbor. Exactly. And it's not a real wall. Yeah. They're just across the yard. And it's fear sometimes, but I I push people to just, you know, whatever um, avenue they take to to help them kind of overcome, whether it's prayer or what, whatever it is, I just hope that they can push themselves to grow individually because when they're growing themselves, we're all going to grow as community and even beyond that on an international level. Everyone wants the freedom, you know, to travel. Like the things that we see, look forward to, Mm-hmm. in our community is to be able to travel. And I hope that one day, you know, the Middle East is even more explored. It's such a beautiful region and people should go and travel there. And when when it gets to that place, and I really think it's through educating the youth, when it gets to that place where the the adults of the country are able to to manage it, that's why there's so much need for aid over there is because there's so much lack of education. The literacy rate is over 60%. We have to be able to get them to be able to help themselves. And people can't help themselves if there's war in their countries. And so I encourage people to Google um, pictures in the 1960s. Women were wearing, you know, pencil skirts and there was, and then show um, photos of a decade later. So there is hope. A lot of people want to say that there's not hope. Like, like let's just, who cares? Just write Leave it, yep. write it off, like put a big shun sign on it. But there, you have to, one, put yourself in people's shoes. The same thing, forbid, could happen here. And so you really have to put yourself in people's shoes and then do some research. I mean, it doesn't take that long, I promise. No, in <laughs> fact, and we'll wrap up here, but like this morning, even just, just I did some quick prep for this conversation and I just Googled, I just put Afghanistan in. Yeah. And pushed images. It's all war. All <laughs> exactly. soldiers, all this. And so I got a little more, I just typed Afghanistan landscape. Afghanistan mountains. Oh, wow. It's fucking beautiful. Yeah. Like there's like snow on mountains and there's Definitely. horses running around. It was beautiful. It looked like, I mean. California. It could have been anywhere. Yeah. But the very first thing that shows up, and for a long time, the very first thing that shows up when you put Afghanistan in exactly. no context, 
just soldiers and war and you know bombs and yeah. it's just crazy to scroll 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 it was all and the neighboring countries and right. it, exactly so it it will change i just don't want it to take you know three decades four decades i i hope that we can get there in a few decades and cool. i really think if we educate the youth we're gonna we're gonna make it happen so let's do a follow-up podcast we next will, time. <laughs> we will. I'm, I'm rooting for you we're rooting for you since awesome. thanks so much thank for this you thank you I received a wonderful piece of advice from podcast listener and Instagram follower, Adina. I want to give credit where credit is due because I'm going to begin implementing what she recommended I do as I wrap up each episode. I am going to begin issuing a challenge to you as we finish each episode, each podcast conversation. Nothing crazy, something small and simple, but something that could very well change your life. So here's this week's challenge, friends. Most of us live in a place where refugees have resettled. There are refugees around you, friends. People that lived the poem that I read before the conversation. People that have lived similar lives to the life that Sinzella, Atmar, and her family lived before coming here. So this week, find one. Make sure they know they are welcome in your town or city or wherever you live. Then, ask them their story. Whether it takes 30 minutes or 7 hours, Shut up and listen and feel. And as you're listening to their story, remember the words from the poem earlier. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. If you take this challenge seriously and do it, I want to know about it. Email me at hello at nicklapara.com or hit me up on Twitter at nicklapara. And there are many more things you can do once you've heard their story. So many refugees need your help today in the resettlement process. They don't know what they're doing, they don't know where they're going. So many of them don't know how to speak English yet or even understand English. There are so many little things that we take for granted, crossing the street, knowing what the street signs mean, going to the grocery store, finding the closest pharmacy. Those are things that they will need to know. And so there are many more things you can do in the refugee world after you learn their story. But I think step one is just stopping for a little bit and listening to their story, listen to everything they have to say, no interruptions, just take it all in. I hope you've enjoyed my conversation with Sinzella Atmar today. To find more information about this podcast conversation and all of Let's Give a Damn in general, go to podcast.letsgiveadam.com. Thank you so much for all the ways you continue to support this show. Keep up the good work. Tell a friend this week. Share this podcast with them. Leave a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. You can also support our show for the price of a shitty cup of Starbucks coffee per month at patreon.com forward slash let's give a damn. Help us make more podcasts, friends. This podcast episode was edited and produced by the incredible Chad Snavely. The music is by our brilliant friend Propaganda. Thank you so much for joining me. I love you. Same time next week. Peace. Peace.